today to introduce our speaker. I want to begin by thanking um, Sage for uh, publishing the journal and all the support that they provide us. I also want to thank Katie Meehan and J.P. Jones um, who talked to me about Paul. <laughs> Paul Robbins earned his bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin in 1989 and then went to Clark to earn his master's in geography in 94. Just two years later, he earned his PhD in geography from the same department. His work in more than 80 journal articles and book chapters, four edited volumes, two monographs, and two textbooks, all incidentally, or not incidentally, done well typing like a mad machine gunner with only his index fingers. Um, reveals a commitment, reveals a commitment to reach with his insights beyond a small community of scholars. And his media presence um, concern, confirms his success. For example, he's been on NPR's On Point, CBC's As It Happens, and even Showtime's Bullshit with Penn and Teller. Um, and in case you were wondering, um, on TV, he cussed less than Penn <laughs> As a faculty member, Paul's not afraid to step up and take his turn at service and administrative leadership. He has chaired Arizona's Human Subjects Review Committee, and he currently serves as director of the School of Geography and Development at the University of Arizona, a school he proposed and whose creation he's spearheaded. And yet, his scholarly production remains undiminished. He stands as one of the people we have to thank for bringing the political into cultural ecology, and who also always understands the science behind each topic he works on. Paul has a way of structuring work that is theoretically complex around things that are good to think with, the forest, the lawn, the elk, and the mosquito, each a big object in its own right, and each in Paul's hands provides rich empirical grounding that enables him to take theory farther, to show how nature becomes institutionalized, the socio-culturalization of nature, if you will, in a two-way street between nature and its management. Paul's work reveals an invigorating ability to think things differently, to draw forward the unexpected and the counterintuitive, that can be about thinking a topic or an issue differently, like conservation, as he's done in work on Indian forests, where he showed that the most biodiverse areas were those in human contact at the edges of the forest preserves. It can be about thinking theory differently, as he's done in his work on assemblage theory. And it can equally be about thinking methods and methodology differently, as he's done in his work using the Q-sort method to reveal unexpected discursive patterns and political alliances between groups thought to be oppositional, like environmentalists and gun owners. In so doing, he has given political ecology and also cultural geography new tools and topics to think with. That's illustrated so well in his book, Lawn People, where Paul revealed not just a political economy of lawns and a Foucauldian understanding of how keeping up with the Joneses in lawn care disciplines white middle class men, but beyond that, how the lawn's own ecology, demanding to be cut once a week, conforms with the Western work week and weekend so that the very concepts of white middle class masculine subjectivity are themselves structured by the lawn. He showed how nature's own productivity, not something discursive, becomes the source of subject construction, how the very aliveness of nature is the source for the construction of subjects. And though his work is serious in the utmost, he does all this always with an intense and genuine sense of joy. I've, per I've heard Paul described more than once by a cliché that I think fits him in so many ways, where it describes his intensity, his productivity, the depth of his insights, and in a way that I hope he will appreciate, it also uh, connects him to his own Research. Paul Robbins, they say, is a force of nature. <laughs> it's my pleasure to present as the Cultural Geographer's, the Cultural Geography's annual lecture, Paul Robbins, whose presentation is entitled Ecological Anxiety Disorder Diagnosing the Politics of the Anthropocene. Please welcome.
Um, there are chairs and stuff. I'm not, it's so uncomfortable. These things are so uncomfortable. So thanks to Sage and Cultural Geographies and Didia and Tim and thanks everybody for coming. And uh, this is some work that uh, Sarah Moore and I have been working through. This is sort of the light version. It doesn't have any Lacan in it. You'll be disappointed, Paul. Um, and it mostly just has biologists, which, uh, which I understand far, uh, far better. In June of 2011, 18 scientists led by this fellow over here, Mark Davis, published a commentary for the journal Nature, it's a, it's a big journal, entitled, Don't Judge Species by Their Origins. It's a clever term on that title. And here they argue that the threats posed by alien and exotic species are grossly overstated. More radically, the essay suggested the very area of invasion biology, this field, stands on shaky ground. This relatively young science, developed from the critically important work of ecologist Charles Elton in the 1950s, but has since exploded into a field of its own in the 1990s. So in this article, Davis and his colleagues address several cherished concepts in uh, invasion biology, including this widely cited but totally empirically un uh, demonstrated uh, uh, claim that invaders are the second greatest threat to the survival of threatened species around the world. So they kind of put a, they put a pin in that. And the essay points out that many species that people take to be native are actually aliens, uh, that many invaders have positive or neutral impacts. And uh, it goes on to argue something further, though, which is that uh, foundational concepts in ecological restoration, starting points, or hopes of environmental return are largely uh, pointless. So this is the field of biological invasions, which was, would, would, would have been unknown to people in 1970 on the first Earth Day, and is now basically a, a going concern. So, uh, enterprise. What he says is most human and natural communities now consist both of long-term residents and new arrivals, and ecosystems are emerging that have never existed before. It's impractical to try to restore ecosystems to some rightful historical state. We must embrace the fact of novel ecosystems and incorporate many alien species into management plans rather than try to achieve the often impossible goal of eradicating them. So similarly, he's argued elsewhere, he and his colleagues, that invasion biology actually should just be abandoned and subsumed back in older concepts like community ecology. Now, uh, there's nothing special, in other words, about uh, exotic species. And, and, and if there was something to return to, it's inaccessible to us in the era of global, uh, global change. And this is the central message, this is the most important part, that he says ought to be taken to the public. In other words, the public has been frightened by science about invasives that's driven them into all kinds of misunderstandings about how things work. Now, this is a pretty innocuous claim. We just usually call that biogeography. Uh, but, but, right? Uh, that's what I told him. But apparently not. Uh, this is an innocuous claim made in the context of a pretty obscure debate in a fairly specialized field, and it set a fire that did not take long to produce a lot of responses. Within one month, we've got a half a dozen commentaries appearing in Nature and Science signed by hundreds of biologists and ecologists and uh, conservationists and resource management, and writing for the objectors in one of these, uh, these key uh, returns, Daniel uh, Simroff stressed that restorations and conservationists don't oppose aliens, just invaders, but aliens are terrifically pernicious, and we can't get that, we can't tell the public what you're telling them. That, that, that this is grossly irresponsible, very dangerous, right? And that we have to be vigilant of introductions. The public has to be vigilant of introductions and continue to support the many successful management efforts. Elsewhere, Lambertini and, uh, and others go on to say, as leaders of conservation organizations, quoting here, with missions to protect biodiversity, we believe that the endorsement of invasive, evading species, although potentially stimulating from an academic point of view, <laughs> risks trivializing the global action that's needed to address one of the most severe and fastest growing threats to biological diversity, which is to say, even if it is true, keep it quiet. <laughs> now, there's a lot to say about this debate. There's a lot to say about the merits of the various positions, uh, but my purpose is here today to decide the point. What is interesting to me is the fervency of this debate, which raises questions about the cultural status of scientific communities and current trends in the sources and terms of their controversies. Davis has clearly hit a nerve here, and it's what biologist Julie Locke, there they have here, the undersigned, think you suck. You know? <laughs> we, we the undersigned. Um, uh, uh, biological Invasions here, this is a, it was a review of recent work. Julie Lockwood calls this claim uh, the third rail of invasion biology. What makes a topic like this the third rail, a topic that dare not be broached? Now, in part, this is because the topic of alien species has complex cultural baggage. I think we know this stuff uh, from geography. Other commentators have notably drawn a clear link between deeply held notions of nation and race in their association with invasive and exotic species. And I would direct you to any, any number of geographers. I particularly like the Australians on this. Um, 
Leslie Head and others, other, other folks uh, at Wollongong that I've had a chance to interact with, but really just all over. They're really good at this in Australia. I don't know why. It's because of a cane toad or whatever. But uh, that's not the argument I want to make. What I want to argue here is that this single debate is indicative of a larger upheaval throughout what most be, could, could best be called the Edenic sciences, which I understand here to include conservation biology, restoration ecology, and invasion biology, among others. These sciences, though rigorous and important in every regard, in every regard, share an explicit methodological and tacit epistemological commitment to evaluating ecological relationships explicitly with regard to an a priori baseline, whether that's a condition before the Columbian encounter, or a time or place before human contact, or a place of expulsion or return, a place before the fall. As such, Davis's novel ecologies represent a material existential crisis for its, ex uh, its practitioners. Whether or not invasion biology is merely restorative nostalgia, that's Davis speaking, that's, that's pretty hard. And not a unique science at all, in other words, has implications for do doing all kinds of science, right? This, this has larger ripple effects on how science is conducted. So in this paper, I'm going to review the nature of recent discomfort, conflict, and ambivalence experienced by research scientists themselves in fields confronting ecological novelty and more generally the Anthropocene. Uh, Anthropocene here I adopt to mean a metaphor, playful metaphoric term assigned most famously to the current geologic period like Miocene and Pliocene by chemist Paul Joseph Crutzen in 2002 to indicate a period in which human activities have come to have significant global impact, starting when James Watt designed the steam engine in 1784, I believe. Sage is even thinking about opening a journal called Anthropocene. In the process, I stress, stress twin emerging and conjoint concerns in ecological scientific communities of this strange uh, ecological era. Specifically, I point to the, on one hand, the concern that scientific practitioners have been, this is a concern espoused by scientists, that practitioners have been insufficiently persistent and explicit in normatively proselytizing the current risks of human impacts. And on the other hand, the obverse concern that many historically common scientific concepts and concerns, only including invasive species, but many others, are overly normative and culturally and politically freighted. They're too, they're too political. I identify the resulting condition as an ecological anxiety disorder, announced either as a fearful response to the negative normative effects of humans on Earth, which I will call anthrophobia, or the inherent influence of normative, evil normative human values within one's own science, autophobia. I further suggest that these concerns, and they're part of this, you see they're conjoined in this debate. I further suggest that these concerns elide the underlying political commitments absolutely inherent in ecological explanation. Briefly reviewing the case of experimental rewilding in the southern Indian Ocean, you can see tortoises, these are fabulous animals. I then provide an alternative mode of resolving and adjudicating human influences, one that is explicitly political. The approach I suggest, following Emma Maris and Bruno Latour, at least in part, is one that must embrace the monsters created in the Anthropocene, but that must also announce its political commitments and struggles, which therefore may productively emerge through alliances between various at risk polities in the world and the ecological science. So to begin with, I wish to review a handful of creative expressions. A handful of creative expressions increasingly, increasingly typical in scientific and popular accounts and debates of ecological process. These kinds of texts, visualizations, and schematics that I'm going to show you have proliferated in recent years, making them what I would call a kind of material culture of the Anthropocene, inflected with particular valences and habits of representation. Consider. The human footprint analysis shown here in this figure, which indicates that large proportions of the global land surface are significantly impacted by human activities. This suggests that 83%, not 82, not 84, of the land surface <laughs> is impacted to some degree, a product of the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia. How do they make this map? It's actually a simple overlay. They pile human population, distribution of roads, uh, navigable rivers, urban areas, and agricultural lands to get an index range of anthropogenic influence, which means it's really just a map of where people are. <laughs> future, future archaeologists may wonder why cartographers of this period chose not to portray the image of the extent of the Earth's surface that had been impacted by other species or beings. For example, making maps to determine, say, how much of the Earth has been impacted by microbes. They would nevertheless have to conclude that the rust-colored blight on the face of the map was meant to signal acute concern of terrestrial decay and the state of fallen grace. Uh, implying uh, uh, the questions about the possibility of return. 
More ambivalent expressions also abound, and I really would recommend this book as a hoot. This is a really good book. <laughs> Consider this popular, you know, everybody knows this book, The Popular Journalistic Account of the World Without Us. This book has been called Left Behind for Seculars. <laughs> and posits what the earth, that's not mine, that's for a guy named Grooms, it's really good. And posits what the earth might look like should humans suddenly disappear. Weissman's book is terrifically compelling, it's beautifully articulate, it's really well written, and it's fascinating. Uh, to be sure. And it also says as much about the built environment, I should say, as the human environment, because it, it uses pretty good current science to show how fast human infrastructure would be metabolized by, like, plants and stuff. I mean, it, 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 the, the traces that would sort of disappear from the Rhodian shore. Um, the book is compelling enough to have inspired a range of nature television uh, versions and parallels to a serious scientific examination of Chernobyl. Uh, in Ukraine, which is an area that has indeed been reclaimed by non-humans since the time of the nuclear disaster there. At bottom, however, so it's a great book, but it taps into something more subtle and prevalent in the imagination of environmental scholars. Reviews of the book by figures like Bill McKibben, is he still around? Is he here? Um, and others chose to accept the fanciful premise as a kind of environmental parable, an end times call to save the earth from humanity. The profound assumption of human exceptionalism is notable again here. Indeed, a far wilder and more dramatic Earth transformative premise would be what the world would look like if fungus suddenly ceased to exist. Whoa. Like, there's a... Wow. The choice to depict one rather than the other marks the work as Anthropocene literature in the formal sense. But it also stands on the horns of a contradiction, which is what I like about Weissman. How fully the world is transformed by our presence, and how indifferently the planet would recover from our absence. Are we too powerful a species, the Anthropocene author anxiously asked, or irrelevant? A final sample of Anthropocene culture is shown here. This one might take a little more explaining. This is a much discussed and widely circulated figure developed by Richard Haas through the awesome piece of state transition kinds of stuff. And his co-authors in a 2009 paper, I won't the, the title's up there. So what is it, let me, help, let me walk you through this. Uh, what it is is like, this is like how things were, and then something happens like climate change or invasive species, and it drives it into some new place. And you'd think it would just sort of go back, right? But what we do know from ecology and, and, and history is that things don't always go back. So sometimes you can wind up in states that where restoration is possible, or if not automatic. In some cases, you can restore the structure or function even though, of this ecosystem, even though it's not the same. It can still do some of the same work. And sometimes restoration is, is impossible and difficult, so you might as well just blow it off, right? Don't worry about it. This is kind of like the, uh, the enjoyer of the serenity prayer of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> to have the serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed back, the courage to change the things that can be restored or replaced, and the wisdom to know the difference. All of you at AA know this one. <laughs> What's clear from this cursory examination of Anthropocene material culture is that it relies heavily on two related tropes, both of which might be hard to recognize from previous generations of scholars. First is the clear and abiding concern, or obsession, with human transformation of the Earth to the point of irreversibility. That becomes a really important part of this. Such that whatever is in front of us is sufficiently different from the past so as to operate by its own rules. There's something Heideggerian about that. Okay. It is, it's all new to me. Like Heidegger, who knew? It is accompanied by an undeniable sense of tragedy, sometimes urgency, and perhaps even more often, panic. This aspect of Anthropocene culture is marked by a clear call to value judgments. We have destroyed something worth preserving, and recovery, restraint, and control are imperative. It's normal. On the other hand, it reflects a repeated concern with the vanishing of environmental baselines, grounded in normal conditions. So that the same thing that causes the concern, the panic, does away with the baselines from which we need to operate, right? Grounded in normal conditions from which to make objective assessments for advocating interventions in the world. In a quickly transforming environment, deeply held human biases, like those towards nativeness, cause apparently scientific assessments of change to be fraught with normative assumptions. Ah, normative. Which must be expelled. That's Davis. Following this line, uh, this, this, there's some geographers. Author date. This, too, is often articulated in a language of concerns. Also, it's concern. The scientific culture of Anthropocene, therefore, exhibits a nervous habit of eschewing precisely the implications of its own enunciation and a fear of making value judgments about the state and trajectory of environmental change. Anthropocene scientific culture simultaneously displays a panic political imperative to intervene more vocally and aggressively in an Earth trans transformation run totally amok, and increasing fear that past scientific claims about the character of ecosystems and their transformation were too normative, prescriptive, or political in nature. We can't go there. Agonizing over the role of advocacy, especially in conservation, is its own cottage industry. You can just go through the literature and you'll find all this hand is out there. 
This internal contradiction is what turns Davis's assertions described at the outset to rethink the categorical nature of species and the framing into a scientific third rail. On the other hand, gazing back over arbitrary categorical delineations of good and bad species through a cultural lens, Davis despairs of the value-laden nature of previous scientific efforts. This time we get it right. He seeks a way back to a more objective assessment of the long, non-teleological arc of ecological change, calling for restraint on the languages of return, <coughs> disaster, and recovery. Seeking to purge human judgment from science, or at least leave such judgment to others, we economists, Davis articulates scientific autophobia, a fear of our own political language and assumptions in scientific assessment. This is really repetitive. You kind of get the picture. For Davis, the murder of the clear, desirable, good ecological conditions heralds a caution against polluting science with the romance of lost past. Quote, quoting here, classifying biota according to cultural standards of belonging, citizenship, and fair play and morality does not advance our understanding of ecology. I mean, I have some sympathy for this argument. Chastising the normative judgments of past practitioners, Davis insists that the public should not be led into unnecessary panic and should instead be told that some alien species are useful. In this sense, the Edenic sciences are too normative and too political for their own good. A new invasion biology would treat all phenomena in a purely descriptive manner and avoid usage of hybrid language that mixes values with scientific concepts. Davis critics, conversely, find such assertions profoundly disturbing. Because human activities have for them so evidently transformed the Earth through precipitating ecologically destructive species invasions and stuff like that global change, this is precisely not the time to send the message of relativism. Does this all sound like the 1990s to you? <laughs> Ecology's happening in the 1990s. <laughs> Articulating against an anthrophobia rooted in their despair of global species decline, they insist that the public must be vigilant of the invasion. That's Dawn. Are you here, Dawn? Vigilance. Eternal vigilance. It's arguably not normative enough. The rate, it's not norm, we're not normative enough. The rate and surprising character of the Earth's transformation have yeah, directed attention to a schism that, that schism, I want to suggest, has always sat at the heart of the environmental sciences. This is not new, right? A fear of normatively bad human influences upon and separations from the natural world, which we all know about in geography, coupled by a fear of the inherently normative and political character of the science that bears on that concern. So that's just that's just always already there. At precisely the, and this is a shame, because at precisely the emancipatory moment that ecological science has transcended the flawed expectation that a single ecological condition can provide the blueprint to regulate and guide human behavior, whether that's like nature or wilderness or the biogeography of the pre-Columbian period or whatever, the community ironically finds itself paralyzed, and I go to these meetings, there's a lot of handwriting, paralyzed by the acknowledgement of human agency on Earth and the normative character of science itself. The resulting anxieties that emerge from this condition are tacitly or explicitly political in nature. But both impose only constraints for action. In a state of anxiety, the anthropophobe despairs, why can't I convince the world to act before the end? Conversely, the autophobe asks, who am I to impose my vision of the world's proper structure or function on others? To be clear, these diagnoses are not criticisms of ecological scientists who have precisely and rigorously identified and tracked very real material changes in the condition of the planet. Rather. This diagnosis is of the culture of science, naming the condition that makes progressive intervention in a changing world unnecessarily difficult. It's okay. By definition, after all, anxieties, including panic and phobia, are disorders only insofar as they interfere, interfere with the daily routine and practice of everyday life, the business of doing science. These disordered conditions are related to the crisis born of the end of nature. Sure, okay, so that's bad. that makes it a little different, but here, understood as an imaginary or cosmological state that provides a grounding orientation. But it's not fear of change. It's not necessarily a form of kinetophobia. I, I, maybe Paul knows how to pronounce that. That prevails. That's a, a fear of novelty itself. It's not a fear of novelty. It's rather a fear of lacking a normative way to judge human actions and decisions in a world condition without precedent. In the absence of an organizing moral compass for protecting ecosystems from human action and directing interventions, a role that has historically been filled by a reconstructed or imaginary past, it's little wonder that the core experience of ecologists would be one of disorientation. Really, it's a fear of getting lost. And I looked in the clinical literature, and I couldn't find that one. So if there's any practitioners out there that can name that, it's like a geographic phobia, you know, fear of getting lost. Yet countless basic decisions still confront us. We have to, you know, we gotta make these decisions one way or another. Do we bodily assist endangered species to move in the face of climate change? I don't know. I can't tell. But we gotta act. Do we freeze their germplasm for the future? Do we conserve them in situ? Should we introduce new species into transformed and damaged ecosystems in an effort to recover or discover new functions? Or do the inevitable uncertainties accompanying such novel permutations represent too grave a risk 
merely an extension of the destructive experiments that brought us here in the first place. As a result, most of the literature dedicated to ecological novelty represents an effort to replace this lost orientation point with an alternative, and a lot of the literature, therefore, is about structure and function, ecosystem structure and function. Uh, I have two pages on ecosystem structure and function, and I'm going to read them. Okay. I, was told, I was told to read them. So this is where you go if you're an ecologist, right? There's an ecologist in here somewhere, a real ecologist. <laughs> Structure refers in a general way to species abundance and composition of an ecosystem at any point in time. It's a compositionless way of determining whether the current ecosystem state uh, resembles its evolutionary heritage. So that would be good, because that's natural in a certain sense, right? That's how that works. As many observers unfortunately have noted, predicting how and why these changes become totally problematic. Simple succession models have been sort of surrendered, right? I mean, Diane knows all this stuff better than anybody. Moreover, it's pretty clear that some system elements can just be replaced wholesale with others, though with unknown effects. So, it's very, and finally, ecologists have long held that structure is arbitrary. It's organized by historical accidents and path dependence, so it makes it impossible to say, even if this is what evolved, whether that's good or right. Structure is just not going to be enough for us. Function is equal, so this is structure. Whoa! <laughs> that's function. Equally problematic, a tacit uh, indication of what the sweet uh, ecosystem act activities, what the ecosystem performs, like producing biomass or metabolizing nutrients, doing, doing work. Uh, ecosystem function allows observers to catalog the kinds of gains and losses that might be at stake in the transformation of the ecosystem, but also to consider how different or new novel ecosystems might equally provide the same lost services so, uh, so as to stand in for one another. Now, problematically, determining which function is desirable is a normative decision that ecologists or eschew, or at least they insist is separate from scientific assessment. This makes the adjudication of preference a process they have increasingly turned over to economists, built through the concept right of ecosystem services. This last move to surrender concepts of value and valuation to another science, the hope is that a rational and optimal decision can be reached free, again, of value, is made by default. That's, made by, that's just a natural extension, is to turn the, to the economist, natural. But also one with further normative implications, and indeed, ultimately, political ones, which is where we're going with this. Traditional normative ecological concepts do not, and not of themselves, provide sufficient purchase to evade the anxieties confronted by scientists in the Anthropocene, which is why they hold so many meetings. This is because the application of either structure or function of these problems inevitably results in a tacit, tacit positing of political questions. What work do anthropogenic, what anthropogenic landscapes do? To whom does value flow from novel landscapes? Whose material and political labor do ecosystems do? Though these are difficult questions to answer, the selection of any ecological intervention will ultimately have to pass through the sites of struggle, over those priorities, and through the relativistic thicket of ecological anxiety. It's too big to get over, it's too wide to get around, it's too deep to get under. More specifically then, to cure our condition, we must accept the radical ruptures made possible by understanding and entering the politics of novel ecologies. In the process, I wish to argue, we must understand novel ecologies, one, as gardens, in the words of Emma Maris, ones that are wholly unruly and rambunctious ones, as monsters, albeit in the words of Bruno Latour, ones deserving of our love, and three, as sites of struggle in the classic Marxian political economic sense, Kevin, of production and accumulation. He understood this way, he set that off, himself. understood this way, paths emerge in the forest to guide our decisions to both or either proliferate or extirpate novel ecologies. Consider Dennis Hansen. Very nice guy. He and his colleagues at University of Zurich, University of Bristol, and the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation are engaged in producing novel ecologies. Specifically, there's the, these are magnificent looking, aren't they? Amazing. Specifically, at island sites in the Indian Ocean, they're engaged in a large scale experiment to restore the native vegetation of these islands, including especially the slow growing ebony hardwood, uh, Diospyrus agretum, a tree that once covered the islands of Mauritius, but which was almost wholly wiped out through successive human occupation and colonial and post-colonial settlements and waves of exploitation. I mean, you know the story, right? <laughs> Kill. So the central barrier to successful recovery of this historic and prehistoric uh, forest landscape, however, has got a problem in the way. Getting these forests back is more than, requires more than planting seeds, unfortunately. That's that the germination and dispersal of the tree's huge pungent fruited seeds here on the right depend heavily on their rumination in the guts of giant tortoises. Regrettably, there hasn't been a giant tortoise on Mauritius since the Saddleback Mauritius giant tortoise was shot dead by some colonial French sailor in the 1700s. They're gone. They're extinct. That would be the end of the story, right? Hansen and his colleagues, so that's just too bad. Hansen and his colleagues' solution to this conundrum is to introduce an exotic alien, 
invasive substitute to the region's island. The Aldabra giant tortoise, uh, well, not, it's not that far away from the northern Indian Ocean. By substituting an alien species for a long gone relative on the island of Iloiglet here, uh, and Round Island, both off Mauritius, Hansen and his associates are violating many of the founding principles of restoration, I should say. It's a very controversial uh, operation. And they're operating in a place pretty much beyond the precautionary principle. I mean, you know, they're, they're out there. Uh, these tortoises are ingesting the fruits, however, distributing their seeds and enhancing tree seed germination since the seeds passing through the gut of the tortoise have been shown in the graph at the right <laughs> to germinate far more successfully than the ones that are just lying around on the, on the beach road. So this effort has, been, has, could, has to be most accurately described as rewilding. Defined here as the introduction of proxies for extinct species in order to reconstruct the structure and function of pre-human or natural ecosystems. Providing, in Caro's terms, ecological proxies for extinct... Uh, yeah, I just, it's the same. Proposals for this sort of effort were made famous and infamous, as we will all recall, in 2005 when Joss Donlin and his colleagues asserted the need to introduce all these African species in the Dakotas. Yeah. Like cheetahs and Asian and African elephants and lions, opponents to rewilding in that form have been uh, vociferous, pointing to the unfitness of African species for North America, the damage this does to extant populations in ascending locations, like your, your, like some white dude is going to take the elephant out of Africa and put it in America. <coughs> Uh, right. Uh, and, and a more general problem that most species introductions result in ecological disaster, as the cane toad wished to move to Australia. These debates revolve around great many uncertainties, including the practical limits, the limits on their social acceptance, the question of the use of scarce conservation resources that could be put somewhere else. This could look like a bit of a boondoggle. Even supporters of this idea consider it one that reflects, quoting, an era of desperation. But beyond these, we can see the imperature of the phobias born of Anthropocene scientific culture in the criticisms of this, possible criticisms of this experiment. They touch directly on whether science has become too normative or not normative enough, too advocacy rooted or instead inadequately connected to, connected to advocacy for nature. Returning to the tortoises of Mauritius and Madagascar, it's not hard to already hear the cries of both autophobes and anthropophobes. For anthropophobes, this sort of experiment must appear all too human and a move away from conservation in a traditional sense, considering this kind of human action to be an extension of further risky human impacts born of hubris, overreach. Odd folks have much hand-wringing to do as well, however, since the contradictory introduction of exotics in the name of restoring a lost imaginary wilderness seems like a dangerous elision of science and normative practice. Who are we, after all, to name one form of reintroduction dangerous and the other restorative? Such an effort surely transcends, in any case, Davis's call for largely descriptive science. But as noted, like this is like a crazy experiment, but as noted previously, to leave our concerns here is a largely fruitless and uh, uh, and would be to ignore the fundamentally political character of what's going on here, and I, I'm going to get to that right now. Adjudicatory criteria have to lie outside of our concern about the a priori -ness of it. What can we conclude, then, is the political economy of this intervention? To whom does value flow, and at whose expense? Now, in that regard, one must initially hold, in profound suspicion, the role and desirability of Anglo-European researchers conducting experiments on landscapes long ago rest from the control of local populations. The landscapes of Mauritius are, after all, the political ecological inheritance of French and British, British colonial struggles and pillage in the southern Indian Ocean, forged into the network of global systems born of development of global naval power in the 1700s. There's a lot of books about that. It was European sailors who feasted on the saddleback giant tortoises until they were driven extinct in the 18th century, and European colonists who stripped the ebony hardwoods of the islands. Who are colonial hegemons to return to these islands and restore them for their own scientific edification? Conversely, what would encourage or allow the source islands for these tortoises, the Aldabra Atoll, where the tortoises come from, in the Seychelles, the western Indian Ocean to the north, to surrender their rare tortoise populations to post-colonial scientists for export to faraway <coughs> islands? Put in bare political terms, what could possibly make the conduct of such experiments useful for those who live around or govern these islands? An answer... The answer lies in the political geography of the islands themselves. Considered within the context of global climate change, which is ultimately in low-lying islands the ultimate case of accumulation by dispossession, the absolute ultimate case, like it just all goes away. Um, considered within, that, uh, considered within the, glo the global climate change question, Iloe Glet is a flat, sandy, coralline limestone formation poking its head above water only slightly, reaching only about 13 meters at its very highest point, but with most of its landscapes within a meter of the sea. The Aldebra Atoll, ascending site, is an area of about 155 square kilometers, making it the second largest raised coral atoll in the world, but also with an average height above sea level of only about 8 meters. With 1 meter rise in sea level, I mean, that's a very safe, I'm safe at that number. 
Christina, am I safe with that number? Okay, that's pretty, that's predictable. Uh, inundation is looming, right, from all these islands. The political economic motivations of both sides in this experiment are therefore linked closely to the production of the global understanding of island nation threats. Now, as we will recall, in October of 2009, the Maldives president, Mohamed Nasheed, and his 11 of his government ministers donned scuba gear and held a cabinet meeting beneath the sea. In time, in time to highlight a spectacular failure of climate talks in Copenhagen uh, that year. Through a spectacularly performative gesture, the global media were captured by the event and forced to report sea level rise, change projections, and basic facts about the topography of the Earth's most vulnerable polities. For the Seychelles and the key shores off Mauritius, no less for the Maldives, the immediate existential crisis of global climate change looms far more prominently than the possible downstream impacts of some tortoise run amok. <laughs> Indeed, the strange scientific ambitions of rewilding conservation experimentalists, experimentalists are in this case precisely suited, or very well suited, to the creation of opportunities for alliance with historically colonized places and people to produce what might be best described as experimental conservation theater. By simultaneously producing nature while drawing attention to the production of nature in terms explicitly congruent with those articulated by materialist scholars in geography, uh, Harvey Smith, author Dave, author Dave, the tortoise project cuts the Gordian knot that otherwise ties the hands of Anthropocene researchers. Well, an autophobe might reasonably ask, therefore, whether rewilding the Indian Ocean is a colonial white restoration fantasy, it is, freighted <laughs> into a normative scientific experiment, crammed into a, a science box, and an anthropophobe might cogitate on whether such an effort is instead a potential Frankenstein nightmare, both would pretty much be missing the point, I would say. Uh, the merits of the so-called Zurich Aldebar research platform must be sorted precisely in terms of its political role in representing and confronting the larger ongoing experiments on the Earth's climate system. That's an experiment promulgated by the world's wealthy and powerful, largely at the peril of the world's poor. Indeed, at both research islands, ongoing evaluation and assessment of climate change impacts is a core condition of the intervention. It's really climate science. A lot of climate science is going on here. Hidden out of the way. Allowing conservation to be explicitly, or at least strategically political, therefore, opens a way to come to terms with and perform proactively in the Anthropocene. It might be added that such experiments have a further merit of providing a therapeutic opportunity for phobic researchers themselves. <laughs> As Hansen and his colleagues actually point out, the merits of these experiments are that they're pretty, they can't be reversible. Tortoises move pretty slow. And they're mostly <laughs> local in impact. So these conditions exactly reproduce one of the clinically proposed treatments for phobias, as it turns out, cognitive behavioral therapy. Specifically, interoceptive therapy simulates the conditions that produce the fear and panic in anxious patients, but under conditions regulated by patients themselves, allowing them to experience the sources of their phobia in a controlled, self-controlled environment. Learning to live in a world crafted by people, but always beyond human control, where scientific concepts and practices can never exist wholly beyond political entanglements in which they emerge, small little doses of confrontation with produced nature may allay the anxieties of scientific practitioners operating in the Anthropocene. So it would be good for them. <laughs> Let me sum up. Watching the Sandhill Cranes gathering in the Platte River in Nebraska in her recent book, Rambunctious Garden, this is another great book. Uh, Emma Maris notes that the landscape into which the birds descend is largely an artificial product of agro-industrial development. Does this make it counterfeit, she asks? Nope. I like anybody who can write nope. <laughs> Not in my opinion. Humans and birds have collaborated to create this beauty. This conscious and responsible and joyful cohabitation is the future of our planet, our vibrant, thriving, rambunctious earth. Like the tortoises of the Indian Ocean, the cranes belong because they are there and not vice versa. Of course, Samuel Crane's an easy case. What do we make of more foreign fellow travelers like BT Cotton or nuclear waste? As Latour has reminded us, these two must be treated with careful symmetry. In the essay, recent essay, Love Your Monsters, he reminds us that the tragic narrative power of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is rooted in Frankenstein's The Doctor's Moral Failure. But this moral failure was not that he invented a creature through some combination of hubris and high technology, but rather that he abandoned the creature to itself. Embrace the solutions and the problems posed by technoscience, BT cotton, and nuclear waste addressed head-on and not evaded through some simple reputation or endemic retreat. For Latour and others, however, the adjudication of such choices is not getting out without a critique. For deciding which monsters to create and which to love is largely a question of good, liberal, and communicative collective discussion. Convening a liberal, you know, the parliament of things, in a more democratic fashion, they suggest, would allow us to outline the division of powers that would govern how humans and non-humans are represented. Now, as has been noted elsewhere by smarter people than me, seeking to adjudicate post-environmental decisions through liberal mechanisms, whether concerning cranes, tortoises, or hazardous waste, 
is optimistic in a world of spiraling asymmetries, as where the people of the Maldives face extinction at the hands of indifferent SUV drivers in large populous nations, and those whose accumulating surpluses hinge on marketing and selling those very machines. This would be a politics without politics, as Wainwright observes. The metaphorical powers of a new constitution like this are presented with no analysis of the barriers that exist to their actual existence, and no discussion of how they might come into being. Thus, given that not all novel ecologies are equal, and that parties to their adjudication are unlikely to symmetrically share the stakes during any sort of polite parliamentary procedures, sorting the novel ecologies must be of the kind shown here, where scientists enter forcefully into political alliances, cynically in a certain sense, wonderfully cynically, happily cynically, in which the stakes of the experiments are linked to the fates of interested parties. Here it will be essential to explicitly produce experimental natures, in collaboration with polities interested in their structure and function, and do so to explicitly advocate or oppose other productive and accumulative experiments like global carbon loading. Such an intervention for the grounds, are the grounds for supporting or opposing it. It must be developed through scientific research that acknowledges and is steeped in the stakes for the differing outcomes. Right. So, to sum up, it is true that regular aerobic exercise, improved sleep hygiene, and reducing caffeine are useful in treating anxiety. But in an uneasy world of the Anthropocene, a more direct treatment will come from naming the politics of intervention, admitting the struggle that follows from embracing novelty, and dispensing with imaginary places to which there is ever hope of return. These together can help throw the switch that shuts down the power that makes the third rail of conservation and ecology so, so dangerous for scientists to touch. Thank you. Thank you.